So our last topic for the quarter is on tiebacks, and we're only going to talk about the tieback, uh, the, the tieback anchoring system of, of the wall, and a few other aspects of, of, the, of the wall design that are um, important when you use tiebacks. So the rest of the stuff we've talked about for whether the H pi walls or diaphragm walls all apply. And, and we're going to look at this in sort of from the, the same viewpoint that we looked at brace excavations. We're using apparent earth pressure diagrams. And we're, we're going to start, start there and talk about how apparent earth pressure diagrams for tieback walls are different than they are for brace excavations. But we're going to start today with just an overview of tiebacks and how they're installed because as with all these earth retention systems, the actual construction process is important to understand in order to design them. So um, when we're done with this, you should definitely be able to describe this construction sequence and the different grouting methods. You have to understand the different grouting methods to understand how the design goes. Uh, and there are different tendon types. You need to be able to describe those. Um, we're going to talk about compression tendons versus, t versus uh, tension anchors, which, which sounds a little weird because these anchors are all in tension, but I'll explain to it when we get into it. This has to, de to do with details of how the loads are transferred from the tendons to the grout to the soil. Um, so it sounds a little weird when we're talking about anchors. We're talking about compression anchors, but you'll understand, well, you'd better understand when we're done with it. Um, and then we'll talk about the different uh, foliar, uh, fa uh, failure modes. You need to be able to describe those. And then um, you need to be able to describe how that stresses that when you pull on a tendon, how those stresses are actually mobilized within the, within the, the uh, bonded area. And, and we'll discuss why people sometimes use multiple anchors in that area. All right, so let's just overview the process. Um, or not the process, I'm sorry, overview what the, the, the uh, um, what an anchor is and, and how it's put in. So an anchor has um, two zones. It has, a, it has a bonded zone where it's actually connected to, um, where it's actually grouted and, and structurally connected to the soil. And then it has an unbonded zone above that. where the anchor is actually free in the, the, the drill hole that you've made for it. It's not bonded there. This is one of the big differences between anchors and soil nails. Soil nails are fully grouted all the way. They're bonded their full length. Anchors are not bonded. So we have an anchorage zone in the, um, um, we have an anchorage zone in the back, and then it's, it's tensioned uh, to support the wall. So you have, you actually, pull on the, the anchor here and, and fasten it here. So there's a tension in this direction, and there's a tension in this direction from the bonded area. So the, the, tendon in, the tendon in here is in tension the whole time. And instead of pushing on the wall from the inside, as we do with a braced excavation or something, we're actually pulling on the wall from the back side. And so we, uh, this bonded area needs to be behind the zone where you have a potential failure. So this is our failure surface. Normally, we're going to take this as 45 minus phi over 2. And it's pretty apparent that your bonded zone needs to be behind there. If you put it on the other side, the whole thing's just going to, you can put a lot of tension in it, and the whole thing's just going to slide down the hill anyway. So that's how the, the, the system is basically set up. Um, we classify uh, tiebacks based on their design life, uh, and by that we basically mean temporary. Many, many tiebacks put in for temporary excavation, where we're doing excavation support for some basement, and they're only going to be there for a short period of time. For us, a short period of time generally falls in about two years, um, or for permanent uh, anchors, which are ones to design even a lot longer. Big difference in how you design those. In fact, for a long time, LA County didn't allow any permanent uh, um, uh, tiebacks. They've, they've only in the last, well, probably, I guess it's probably the last 10 years now, uh, accepted some permanent tiebacks. So originally, tiebacks were, were thought of only as temporary excavation. Uh, the other way we classify them is on the way that the grouting is done. The simplest grouting is just trimmy grouting, which is just gravity grouting. Uh, so all you do is you're going to insert 
in, in your hole, you're in a tube down here to, to, the, to the bottom, and you'll just grout it up from the bottom up, and it's, it's pumped in. I said it's gravity. It's pumped in, but it's not pressurized. You're just, you're just pumping it in order to, to make sure it gets down in the bottom of the hole. But there's no, pressure, there's no pressurization there. The second one is pressure grouted, where you're going to put a packer in here. A packer is just something you expand in the hole to close the hole around the tendon. So it's basically an inflatable donut. And you have an inflatable donut around your tendons. And then you're going you're gonna to pump the grout in with pressure. And you can tell the difference here is it's actually expanded the size of the uh, hole that you drilled to install the, the tie back. And so that's pressure grouting. And there's one that's called post grouting. And, and with post grouting, you start with a, a, a trimmy uh, uh, grout. So you, you grout this thing with a trimmy grout. And after that grout is set up some, then you grout it again. And, the, and with the grouting, again, um, um, it allows the, you can actually grout with a higher pressure when you do that than just when you have a packer here. And it allows for penetration of the grout into the formation. And you tend to get a much rougher finished uh, anchor zone when you do that. Sometimes that's called regrouting. This is also sometimes called regrouting. Uh, and then you can also underream them. This is not very common anymore, but you can come in with a drill that somehow that makes underreams kind of like a belled case on, where, and you go in there and you underream it, and you pull it out a little and underream it again, underream it again. Um, but because post grouting has become so effective, underreaming is not particularly that common anymore, but it is still done some places. So that's the fourth kind of um, grouting method. And then we also classify them based on the type of ground that we're in. And here we, divided, uh, we divide our, our anchoring systems into three different ground types, either rock, clays or fine grain soils, or sands or coarse grain soils. Because the bonding, uh, the, the bonding mechanisms and the bonding strength that you get in these three soil systems will differ substantially. So when we talk about this, the actual strength of the bond and the grouting system, um, the, the type of soil, or soil that you're in or the rock or soil you're in is important. OK, tendon materials. There are, uh, most of the tendons are steel strands. It is possible to put a solid bar tendon in, but that's not very common, although it's, it's possible. So the steel strands uh, are what we usually use. Um, this is the, the it's, it's more common to use, the, the, we generally use a steel strand about this size, 13 millimeter strand. Um, and if, if you need more capacity, sometimes it's better just to put more strands in the bundle rather than go to a bigger strand, because you get better, you, you get more surface area with the smaller strands, and so you get better bonding in the strands. Um, when we use bars, um, they're generally, um, um, they're relatively small diameter bars, because you have to have room to grout around them. Um, so 26 to 36 millimeters. And they're usually uh, 150 to 600 grade steel. The metric sizes, the metric specifications are there. Uh, so these are these are used for rel these are these are actually for relatively light loads. And these are these are for your higher capacity. So generally, the bars are actually used for the for the for the lighter loads, and the and the uh, the strands used for higher capacity. And, and I see strands used more, a lot more than, than bars. Um, the strands transport better. They get higher capacity. They're a lot more flexible. Um, so it seems to be more common. So this is a, some typical uh, pictures of strand and tendons. Um, you can, um, they're often, well, here you see your strand and tendons. And, and, and you see these little plastic things in there. Those are spacers that are designed to make sure that the tendons get separated so that when you, when you when you grout them, they're actually not all in one bundle. You can get the grout completely around them. Um, and then they're often, put, they're often put in a big sheath like this. This is particularly true for permanent anchors. Because with permanent anchors, you've got to worry about corrosion. So they're often put in a, in a sheath. And, and, uh, and the sheath has corro and they're, and they're, they have uh, uh, anti-corrosion coatings and, and stuff uh, for the, actually fill the sheath. There's a centralizer on the sheath here. So that makes sure it stays in the center of the hole. And on, on, on the, um, 
wall side, you have these um, cone-shaped um, um, wedges that actually, and, and uh, the, the, the wedges actually have, have little grooves for every one of the strands in your stranded cable so that they actually fit really tight around the cable and then they use friction to lock them into the, to the, um, to the wall. So on the, that's what happens on the wall side. So it's not just a little cable that you throw down the hole and uh, the, the actual design of the whole strand and strand system is very important. So here's some pictures of some, uh, some bars. Again, notice that the bars have centralizers on them. Uh, they can also be joined together. These are actually joints for the bars where they're screwed together. These, I think these are Dewey Dag bars. And for the bars, um, you can actually have threaded bars. Dewey Dag is a, is a commercial name, but it's also it's, it's sort of like Kleenex. Sometimes people use that just to talk about a, a, a um, threaded bar. So the bars have thread on, uh, thread on them usually, and so you, in these ones, you tension them by, by tightening a nut down. And you, and you, you, um, you I, the, I don't know that they actually measure, I don't know whether they actually pull on them and then tighten the nut down, or whether they're just, they just use um, turns of the nut to calculate the loads in the bars. I think they, I think they generally pull on them and then tighten the nuts down to take the load off the, off the, um, um, the jack that's jacketing. I've seen, I've seen strands put in. I've actually never seen a, a, a bar uh, tieback systems put in. So the installation process, you're going to drill a hole. You're taught, you're, your tie back holes, even if they don't, aren't required for other purposes to be angled, they almost always are because it makes it easier to put the tendons in and, and easier to grout. So there's actually a minimum angle on there. We'll talk about that later. So that's the very first thing you do. And here you see the, uh, the drill rig uh, uh, drilling the grout holes here. They've, this is actually for a slope stabilization project, not for a, a wall, but it was a really good series of pictures. And so there, you, you can see all the tendon holes that they're going to, all the tendons they're going to put in here. Uh, tiebacks are going to put in here, and here's the drill rig, drill in the holes, and then you insert the tendon. So inserting the tendon, unless it's a really short tieback with a bar, inserting the tendon is much more complicated than just throwing a bar in a hole. So here's a picture of the tendon installation process. So first of all, you notice there's one, two, three, four, five uh, laborers there shoving this tendon into this t into this system here. And you notice that we say a tendon, and it looks like a pretty big thing. Well, th this is the encapsulated tendon that I showed you the picture of before. So, so the the um, the grout is that in this case is actually going to is going to go both inside the the tendon and actually and uh, um, sort of inside this encapsulated thing and outside of it. So it's actually there's actually going to be this plastic thing um, that's grouted in place. These are your uh, your grout tubes. There's two grout tubes there, so th um, th this, um, these, are, these are actually the regrout tubes. The grout tubes themselves are inside the tendon. And so the next thing you're going to do is, is grout. Uh, so the grout process, you have to have a, um, um, a grout plant on site generally do this. You don't, you don't generally order a concrete truck full of grout. Um, so you have to have a grout plant on, on site uh, that requires water, it requires something to hold your cement, and requires a mixer, and then it requires a grout pump that's actually going to transfer that to the, uh, um, that's actually going to push the grout out through the pipes. Uh, once, you have, once it's grouted and cured, then you're going to, um, you both load and test the, the tendon. So on the right, this is the way the, the loading is done. So at the, the so this is a, a hollow jack. So it's a, it's a cylindrical jack that's open in the middle. So it's kind of like a donut-shaped jack. The tendons come through the middle of the jack. And then on this end, you have one of those wedge systems, but it has, um, not called soft, it has removable wedges. It has wedges that will come undone easily. And, and, you, and you're actually pulling on the tendons back here. So this is, this is the reaction where you're pulling on the tendons. And you notice on the front, the jack system is open. And, and here is um, a um, set of tendons that's already been installed. And this is that wedge, this is the permanent uh, wedge uh, locking system. So you pull on the tendon back here, and then, you put, and then you put your little wedges in up here, and then you're going to release the tension here 
there'll be a little relaxation of the tendons when you do that because it takes a little bit of displacement for them to lock in. You have to actually calculate how much stress you're going to lose in the, in the seating. And so you overstress your tendons, put your wedges in, and then release it. And then you release the wedges out here at the back side, and you can take the whole anchor off, and then it looks like this afterwards. The other thing you do while you're doing that is you actually test the, the um, tendons in place. We're not going to go through the test procedures. There's several different uh, ways to do the test procedures. But here's an example where, the, where they're testing the tendons. You can tell they're testing it here. Whoops, there's your jack. Uh, they've got a, a pressure gauge. Sometimes they, they used to always do this with pressure gauges. Now sometimes they'll have load cells on the jacks. So, but here the guy uh, is, is reading the load off. You can see that he's got a dial gauge set up here to read the displacements of the end, end of the, uh, the jack system. So they know, they know the displacements, they know the loads they're putting on there. And, and they'll, they're, they're generally loaded to uh, 160 to 200 percent of the design load. Uh, one of the things that I'll point out when we do talk about design is the designs are very empirical. And, and w when we design these things, what we're really doing is doing an estimate of the capacity of the anchors we're getting to field. And we go out and put some anchors in and see what we're really getting. And then adjust the design based on the actual anchorage forces we can get. Um, but generally speaking, the, these are 100% tested in the field. They almost always test them all. So this is from the Gold Line extension, the Eastside Gold Line extension installation. So this is, a, this is for an H-pile wall. And you can see in the H-pile wall, they've already made holes in their um, um, lagging for where the, where the um, anchor's going to go in. Here's their um, drill rig that's going to drill the holes for the anchors. These are the anchors they put in. In this case, these, are, these anchors uh, were, not, were not encapsulated because these are temporary anchors. That previous. Um, Said I showed you the, uh, with the with the encapsulated tendon. So here we have the encapsulated tendon. That was for a permanent. This is a permanent installation. This is a permanent um, um, reinforcement a tieback system for a slope stability stabilization. So those are permanent. And the permanent anchors are always enclosed in tendons. I mean, t tendons are always enclosed, encapsulated uh, to prevent corrosion. And they're encapsulated the full length of the of the um, tendon. For temporary uh, excavations, it's generally not, it's not always necessary to encapsulate them. So here are the tendon systems that are going in there. You can see they have these things. Some people call them Chinese lanterns, but these are the centralizers. Here's the grout tubes that are going in. And you can see the bonded length. If you actually look at this, you can see the bonded and the unbonded length. You see the color changes there. This is the bonded length, and that's the unbonded length at the other end. I think that's right. Could be the other way around. So here you can see the um, the tendons are installed. They're just pushed all the way in down to the bottom hole, and you can see the tubes coming out, the grout tubes. Uh, so here's the system installed, and this in this one, they're using um, this whale to support two two different H piles. Remember, the holes were actually in the um, the um, sh the uh, lagging between them. And then they've got this, this, this system uh, to, to, um, to tension them and, and transfer the loads from these two anchors to, to two adjacent H-piles. Here's the uh, jack system. You can, you can see the back of the jack system where the, the um, tendons are, are uh, pulled through and locked in. And I, did, I didn't have a picture of them actually uh, post tension but if you, you can kind of hard to see here, but you can. This, this is open from the top and the bottom, and you can see right into where the, the actual tendons are located. And there'll be a second um, wedge block similar to this one in here, but that's a permanent um, locking system. So they pull them, tension them, put the wedges in. Uh, they pull them, tension them, test, uh, do, do, the, do the load test. Uh, and then once, if it passes the load test, then they'll put the wedges in and release the load and, and lock in the load on the, on the tendons. So that's so. Let's talk about how. Um, so that's tendon design. Any questions about tendons and how they're installed? All right. Well, let's talk about uh, failure modes that we can have in anchored walls. Um, so um, we can obviously have a, a failure of the wall in bending if we exceed 
the um, bending capacity. Um, if we don't, if we have insufficient capacity in the toe, uh, if the power unit doesn't go deep enough, uh, we can have a passive failure of the toe, just like we can have for uh, for an anchor, for any other kind of anchored wall. Uh, we can have uh, a rotation failure. Um, because we're pulling down on these, because the tendons are always anchored, there's always a downward a load on these that's provided by the tendon. And if you, and if you don't have um, sufficient uh, bearing capacity at the base of the of that you put in, you can actually cause a bearing capacity failure. The worst thing about that is not that you have a bearing capacity failure, but if you pull it down, you're going to lose your anchor. You're going to lose your, your uh, load in your anchors. Um, we can have uh, a failure by overturning. This is generally the, the geometry of our problem, but it's impossible. If you, if you don't get if you get the anchor behind, behind the anchor, so you could get uh, overturning failure. Um, you can have a failure uh, surface behind. This is these two are really just ca two different cases of global stability. You can have a you can have a failure in a wedge shape failure here, or you can have a global stability failure. But they're really just two different kinds of global stability failures. So those are all the methods that we all the different ways we can have failures. Uh, and then in the average system itself. We can have failure either because we exceed the capacity of the tendons, and the tendons themselves fail in, in uh, tense, tension. Um, we can have um, pull out. We can have failure of the interface between the grout and the soil. The, the tendons are in the grout, but the, the failure at the grout soil interface, or we can have a failure at the tendon-grout interface. Remember, the tendons are in the middle of the hole. There's grout surrounding them, and that connects the tendons to the, to the soil. So you can have either failure at the soil interface or at the tendon-grout interface. So those are the three um, failure modes within the anchorage system itself we need to worry about. There's, there's some other minor, you, can, you can't actually have a failure up where you've got a connection. That's, that's uh, I can put that in a, I don't know whether you put that in the anchorage system failure or in the wall system failure, but you do need to worry about the details of how that's attached. And if you look back at um, you look back at this picture, you realize there's actually some thought put into this and how it's attached, how how this is put together. And notice there's stiffeners here. So there's a lot of structural details to doing that correctly. Uh, so, of the anchors themselves, uh, uh, anchor failure modes. We can, we can. The tendon can rupture. Uh, this, uh, uh, the tendon grout bond can fail. So that's the grout between the tendon and the bout, or the soil grout bond can fail. Um, we can also have a failure that leads to tendon rupture, but it's really because of corrosion of the tendon. So this is a bigger issue with permanent anchors than with with uh, temporary anchors. I mean, I, I, I guess if you wanted to, you could call this a subset of tendon uh, rupture. Um, we can also get failures because uh, of creep, either between the tendons and the grout or the grout and the soil. If there's a, if there's a creep phenomenon, if we get the loads too high, th there'll be some relaxation in the soils or in the tendons, and we'll actually lose, stre we'll lose the, uh, anch the um, load in the anchor because of creep. So one of the tests that you one of the tests that you always do in these uh, when you do those load tests is a, there's a long-term load test that you do. It's, it's long-term. It's like overnight, but there's a long-term load test that you do to ensure that you're not going to have any creep problems. Um, Tie-off failure. That's a failure to actually uh, keep the load in. You know, you, you you stress these things. You put your little wedges in there and then you release them. And if you don't tie them off correctly, you know you can. You, the, only, the only time you know the load is when, is when you have the jack on there. As soon as you take the jack off, you don't really know what the load is in the tendons. We don't normally put strain gauges on the tendons. And so you've got to be sure that you have your, your lock-off system correct so that you don't get too much relief re in the tendons as, you, as they, as they uh, pull those cones into the friction system that locks them up. All right, let's talk about the anchors themselves. There's two kinds of anchors. There's tension anchors and compression anchors. This, this is when I say tension and compression, I'm not talking about what happens in in the tendon. Okay, 
The tendon is always in tension. What we're talking about is what's happening down here in, in the uh, grout area. So a ten, in a tension anger, uh, let me try and speak more carefully. Let, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let, me, let me erase this and start over. Let's just make sure we're, this is clear what we're talking about. This is the unbonded length of the anchor. So this is the zone, if you look in here, where there's no contact between the grout and the tendon. So the tendon's not bonded anything. It's loose inside the hole or loose inside the encapsulation. It, there's, there's no shear attachment. This is the bond zone. Um, um, so this is the zone where there's bonding between the grout and um, the soil. There's actually bonding between the grout and the soil up here, but, it's no, but there's no connection to the tendon. So this is the zone where, where the system is actually anchored into the soil. When you have, uh, and so they call that the anchor bond, the anchor bond length. When you have uh, the, the tendon bond length, which is the length that the tendon itself is bonded to the, let me draw that in a different color. Let me see, let me just do this like this. So this is the anchor bond length. That's the length where the, anch where, where the system is actually bonded to the soil. Then we have the tendon bond length, which is the length where the tendon is bonded to the grout. When those are the same, we have what's called a tension anchor. And I'll, we'll explain that by how the loading goes. So when you pull on a tension anchor, if you think about it, when you pull on a tension anchor, the load is going to be transferred from the tendon, has to be transferred from the tendon to the grout and from the grout to the soil. So when you first start pulling on it, the first place load is going to be transferred is right up here where the tendon is first bonded to the grout. And until, and, and until that capacity is reached, the load's not going to be transferred further down the tendon. And all of these grout systems have a, um, at both a, a uh, peak and, and a residual capacity. As you start loading the grout, the, the bonding between the grout and the tendon is going to have a peak capacity. Once you go back to pieces, it's going to go down to some lower value. So when I initially, when you initially load the anchor, most of the most of the stress in the anchor is going to be delivered to the front part of the of the anchored zone. So this is the end of the bond length. This is the beginning of the bond length. When you start failing in here, and, you, and this load gets dropped down to the residual length, this, this um, stress bulb, if you want to think of it, transfers down the grout. So as you, as you load it a little further, up here you're going to exceed the capacity of the grout anchor bond, and you're going to drop down the residual value. And that's going to allow the load in the tendon to be transferred further down. And, and this is going to continue until you until you load the whole anchors, and, and eventually, if you kept pulling and fail it, you're going to eventually end up with just this residual capacity in the anchor. Uh, so these are, so the, 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 and they call them tension anchors because when you, in your early loading, you've got to load up here but not back here, so the grout is actually in tension inside there because you're pulling on the front of the grout and not the back part of the grout. So these are kind of inefficient because you basically have to fail the front part of the anchor in order to start mobilizing the capacity farther down the anchor. So they tend to be kind of inefficient in terms of transferring load from the, from the, from the tendons to the grout. We're talking about the transfer here from the tendon to the grout. The um, opposite of that is what's called a compression anchor. In a compression anchor, I still have the same um, anchor bond length. So the, the, the bond between the anchor and the soil is still the same length. However, I isolate my tendon. I, 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 I put a, um, something in here to isolate the tendon, so it, and then there's a, an end plate down here that the tendon's attached to. So the load is actually completely transferred from the anchor plate here to this end plate there, and that only place load is transferred uh, th at the wall, it's always transferred at the end plate at the wall, but within the anchorage zone, it's actually transferred, instead of the transfer starting at the top of the anchored zone, 
it all starts at the bottom of the anchor zone. So that means all this grout in here is in compression. And it's going to be much stronger in compression than it is uh, in tension. So, so the load transfer in this system, oh, and then there, there's a third, I'll go through the load transfer in a second. The third system is, uh, is a composite one where you have a tendon bond length that has a finite size and you have an anchor bond length that's still lar larger than that. So in this case, you're going to start transferring load in the middle of it, and this part of the anchor will be in compression, and the back part of the anchor will be in tension. So those are the three different kinds of uh, anchors you can put in. And with a compression anchor, so we're just going to look at the compression anchor. With a compression anchor, the initial loading is at the back side of the anchor, right? So now your initial loading is at the back of the anchor because it's being loaded from the plate. And then as you exceed the capacity of the area near there, the load is going to transfer in this direction. So this tends to be a more efficient way to transfer the load. And, and the, other, the other nice thing about this is the grout's all going to be in compression. This one and not in tension. So the grout, the, you're actually going to get a better um, capacity out of your anchor with this system. And then you can imagine if you, I don't think I have a plot for the, um, um, for the combined one, you're going to start with the kind of a combination of loading in the middle and, and it's going to load, it's going to start in the middle and load this way and then load that way. So one of the issues here is we basically never have a uniform high capacity uh, bond load between the anchor and the grout because you've always you know, assuming that you've got more capacity in your anchor than you want, which is the way you design it, you're always going to be loading at part of the anchor until you, until you have a local failure at that part of the anchor and then transfer the load up. So that's fine for, for, uh, for uh, low, low capacity or medium anchors, but if you have really high capacity anchors, you can have a problem where you, you can't get the load transferred effect efficiently out of, the, out of the tendons to the grout to get it to the soil because um, if, if you have a very high capacity anchor, you could basically fail the soil and, and, and never get, fail the grout anchor bond and never get the, the, the load transferred through there. So sometimes um, they put in what they call multiple anchor systems. So if, you, if, you were, if this was the anchor system you, that you thought you needed for a single anchor system, right, and if, if you have a uh, tension anchor, most of the load is going to be transferred up here and you're not going to get much back there. If you have a compression anchor, most of the load is going to be transferred up there, you're not going to get much here. Well, you can split that up if you're if you're putting um, multiple tendons in. You can actually split your uh, if you can put multiple tendons in a single hole. You can actually split up um, your anchor systems and put in multiple anchors. So what you're going to do is, and let's just assume they're all compression anchors. You're going to put in uh, a bunch of different compression anchors at different distances within your bond zone. So this is your bond zone. And then the net result is going to be, it won't be a uniform, but it'll be a more uniform distribution of stresses within the anchorage zone. This is, a, this is used sometimes when you have very high capacity. If you've got to go, and some, sometimes these anchors can be really long. If you've got to go 75 feet back with an anchor, you know, you're, you're better, it's, it's cheaper to drill few, fewer holes and put in higher capacity anchors. So you'll drill a fairly large hole, put several tendons in, Put the uh, vary the anchorage zones for each one, so you have a single you have a single uh, uh, long anchor, but the anchorage zones for the tendons are at separate places along it, and you get a more even distribution of loads across the anchor. Does that make sense? At least conceptually. Question. So so this is all going to be grouted, eventually. But these are, but so, so this is, let me go back to that nomenclature. Your anchor bond length is going to be that, that whole length. You're going to have anchor bond length and you're going to have tendon bond length. So what you're doing here is, if this is your anchor, let me uh, put these in the same colors I was using before. So this is your anchor bond length. So there's, there's full grout contact here between the soil all the way along here and all the way along here. 
And then your tendon bond length, so this one's going to have one single, this is going to be your tendon bond length. And it's kept one single one. So you're going to have you're going to have a stress concentration either at the front if it's a tension tendon or at the back if it's a compression tendon or in the middle if you do a composite. In this one, you're going to have four different tendon bond lengths. One for each of the tendons. You're going to separate your bundle. Instead of having one big bundle in there, you're going to have four little bundles in there. And each one's going to be grouted separately. You're still going to get a full, you're still going to have to get a full, ensure that you get a full grout to the, to the entire anchor bond length to grout between the soil and the, anch and the, and the grout. But you're going to grout these separately. Yeah, you're still going to, yeah, yeah, you're going to have slightly, generally speaking, the, the, when you do this, uh, so, so the question is, well, do you tension them all at once, you, get, you know, the, the, tension, the tendons aren't going to be the same length, you have different yields. We're, you're generally talking about an anchor, anchor length that's, that's uh, a few feet to tens of feet on an anchor that's, that, that, you know, that might be 75 or 50 feet. So th that, that difference in length is not going to be a big difference. So the difference, you know, maybe you got, you got anchors that are 75 feet long and the difference in the tendon lengths is, is a total of six, maybe they're six inches each one or, or a foot, it's a few feet. So that's not, a, that's not such a big issue. Well, the, the, the goal of doing this is to get a more uniform distribution of stress in the grout system, particularly when you've got a high capacity, an when you've got a high capacity anchor. No, no, it's no, it's just once. The, the, so these are conceptuals. Um, let's go back. Um, let's just use the compression anchor. So if you, um, so if this is if, if if this is the stress as a function of length, then the total load in here is the area under here, right? So I should actually be careful. When, I, let me draw this more accurately. When you initially load it, you, you're going to have a load like this. It's going to come down to zero down here someplace because all you're doing is loading. Right? So this is this is all the capacity you put into it. And if you keep pulling on it, you're going to be able to put you're going to put more load in it. So if you keep pulling on it, eventually you're going to fail it down here at the end because that's where your load concentration. So that load is going to drop down. It, it might feel completely be down to zero. Or it might be, if there's a residual, it might actually be like that. And then you're going to load up to here, you know, and, and this will actually come down to zero eventually. Well, this area is a much bigger load. So if I was just looking at my force um, versus time, you know, when I'm pulling on the tension tendon, so, the, you know, this might be what's happening through the green area, right? And then through the red area, you know, I'll go up through here, and then if we go to the blue area, you know, so the blue area might have be loaded like this. You know, that might be slightly higher, but eventually, if I keep pull, if I keep pulling it, I am going to get complete failure down here, and then you know, my and my tendon is going to going to fail eventually. But the point is, when I'm in the middle of this anchorage zone. Um, I, I can't mobilize. I can't mobilize this peak capacity all the way across the anchor, because I, I can't. I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not applying the load across the anchor. I'm applying it really at a in, in a in a compression anchor at the back, and a tension anchor. It's going to start at the front. If this was perfectly stiff, if, if the grout was perfectly, if the bond between the steel and the grout were perfectly stiff and they had the same modulus, then you could load the whole thing at once. But, the, but, it's, but it's, it's not perfectly stiff, and the grout has a peak and residual strength. So once you re exceed its capacity, it's going to drop to a lower, lower capacity. So the point is, you can't load the whole thing to a uniform stress at one time. Again, we're talking about the, 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 capa the load between the uh, tendon and the grout. It's because the tendon's much stiffer than a grout, right? Remember we talked about this with reinforced soils, about how the load was transferred between, 
you know, depending on whether your, your reinforcement was very flexible or very stiff, same, same, same issue here. This is not an issue between the grout and the soil because the grout's much stiffer than the soil and so you'll, you will get a much more uniform load between the grout and the soil. This is between the tendon and the grout and it's because the tendon is always made of steel. Uh, grout's always made, a, uh, made of Portland cement and so the tendon has a much higher modulus than the grout. Does that answer the questions? Okay. All right. So, um, so, um, so this is just a graphic. I forgot who I stole this from. But if you put, if you have a single, uh, uh, but this is only used for very large systems. I mean, the the, the majority of anchors you're going to put in grout. I find this a really uh, good way to illustrate how the loads are transferred. So if you have a single large tendon, right, you're going to get some, uh, and, and this, is for, um, this is for one that's a, um, obviously a, um, a tension one. Initially, you're going to have some load like this. When you get the thing up to kind of its peak capacity, it's going to have some load in the tendon like that. That's the load transferred from the tendon to the grout. Whereas if you put a bunch of small ones, so notice that the average, the average capacity here is something like this. If you put a lot of small ones, you can get an average uh, capacity across it that's much closer to the peak, the peak. Does that make sense? All right, any other questions about, because that's the, it for this, any other questions about the tendon systems? But why this, we don't, we don't design these interface stuff, we just, we, we, you know, people have observed the behavior. We design, the, the design is very empirical. People develop grout systems and grout pressures and, and, and ways to fasten the tendons in and they pull on them, they test them and they got field tests for them and that's how they design them. They're not, we, we don't do a theoretical design here. But understanding the theory of it shows us how we can improve our designs. All right. Let's go ahead and take an early break and then we'll go on to the actual design one afterwards.